This is the 2.8 version. I don't want to do this one. Come on. There we go. Good response. All right, so this is the theorem. And I, don't, I didn't give you homework on this. It's just you apply it. There will be a test question on it. So you do, you do want to have this as a record. Um, you do want to remember it if you ever model anything. You know, as sitting as an undergrad, you think you might not do it, do that. I don't know what I thought I was going to do. Um, but I, I've done a lot of this now. So you never know. So back to the beginning, you have an F. The partial of F, uh, F with respect to Y is continuous in some rectangle. Doesn't have to be a rectangle. I find that dissatisfying. That's okay. Um, it's got to contain that initial condition. So that was the problem with your other other one. Then in some interval that's contained inside this, some interval around the T0, you have a unique solution. And all that's saying is it's covering their butt so that they can say, I've got a solution for a little bit. All bets are off after like this little interval. And the solution, this thing here, that's like your weight trajectory. That's, we usually use phi to stand for the trajectory. So there's more notation. So they're distinguishing that from the y of t that's the unknown in the equation to the y of t that you get as a solution. All right, this is not real analysis, so we really care about how to use this. That's why I'm not going to prove it. It's the wrong class. Good? All right, so how to use it. That's our, our theorem that didn't work out. If I take, I'm making the assumption that t is not zero, which is like not right, but let's take it over and do it anyways. Um, is this f continuous around t equals zero? Is the derivative continuous around that neighborhood of zero? Well, it blows this one right here, right? It's not continuous at t equals zero. So just go through that theorem, like a, the two part check, like this is the checkability part. If I want to just use it, I break out two bullet points. One is my F continuous around a neighborhood of the initial condition. If yes, then you go to the second bullet is the partial derivative with respect to Y continuous around that neighborhood. Pretty much it. So it's a good theorem for checkability. That's how you use it. So the check is to buy just there is a unique solution. It doesn't give it to you. There are people who would just work on these existence and uniqueness theorems. There's a, a really famous control theory guy from Rutgers, mathematician, math department, that used to do a lot of these existence uniqueness theorems. When I actually had to do it, like find it, I went to him, like, how do I find one of these things? He goes, I don't know. Like, I can just tell you it exists and it's unique. That's, that's nice. So the conclusion is you cannot guarantee it. There may be, but you can't guarantee it, right? It's a necessary condition. Okay, I'm gonna skip this part here. All right, why I don't like the theorem from the book, it's, it's a really strong condition to have the um, partial derivatives be bounded. It, it, if it's really continuous on a rectangle, do you remember those the, that section in calc where they had, you had uh, maxes and mins over the whole real line, and then right after that you had uh, over an interval. 
And the way I remember looking at that, because I wasn't the best student at that time, I looked at that and went, oh, it's the same thing as before, except I have to find the critical points and now I have to check the endpoints too. You made a little table, you check the endpoints, you check the critical points. Well, what that really is saying, if you take, if you took any optimization course, they actually, you're looking for on the boundaries, your maximum could happen in the boundaries of a feasible region. Your feasible region was just A to B. The same thing's true here. If you have a, if you have a region and the region's bounded and something's continuous, it's going to have a max or a min inside that, either inside there or on the boundary. So it's going to be bounded. All right. If it's bounded, then it satisfies this condition. This con satisfying this condition is something like a, it's almost like a derivative. Like if you took this over to this other side, you get the difference quotient. It's just, you haven't taken the limit. So it's not as strong as having requiring a derivative. This theorem requires a derivative. That's a strong condition. It's requiring F not just to be continuous. It's requiring this derivative to be continuous. That's pretty, when you write something down, that's pretty hard. Um, when you try to model something real in real life. So um, it turns out that these two are connected and every semester someone laughs. Uh, Dom Rudukevich said he still laughs and he's in graduate school. But don't laugh at this unless you're immature. L is called the Lipschitz constant. Sarah, you just, you just uh, exposed yourself. <laughs> and it sounds like a bad word, right? Um, and then we say F is Lipschitz continuous. So it's something stronger than con being continuous and something weaker than being having the first derivative. Differentiable is a stronger condition than being continuous. If you had a psycho teacher for your account class, they fixated on that, that section. You know, the absolute value of x was the example they gave you. Here is a function, it's continuous, but its derivative doesn't exist at x equals zero. And they spent a lot of time on that. Um, so the version that I prefer is this one because it's, this, it's the weakest condition. Remember, like I told you that if I put something here, it doesn't necessarily mean there is or isn't. I just can tell you that I can't guarantee it. And here, if F, you know, the weakest condition I could put here is F is Lipschitz continuous. And then, it, and this is problem 15 on um, section 2.8. It's one of the last problems, so they probably thought, hey, this is for a Jedi math version of this course. <laughs> Theo, I did see you laugh. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm kind of building myself up here, but so if I have a T and a Y, you can think of it as a plane or think of something on the floor because you're going to go to multiple dimensions. So that's a region. And um, if I have my F wrapped as a 3D plot in physics style, it comes out this way, right? Um, so that, that surface that you get would have to be continuous over that, over that region. How many of you are um, OR students? Any OR students in here? All right, so anybody take optimization courses? Like uh, they have uh, linear and nonlinear right here? No? Okay. So you have no idea when I'm talking about feasible regions. Um, Lipschitz is a stronger condition. You want me to go back to that? Lipschitz is a stronger condition than just being continuous, but weaker than requiring the derivative to be continuous. And this matters, like, um, you know, when, like, you think of the guys from Eeks that were trying to model this thing, I didn't want to make a strong condition because then their model will fall apart. So I needed, like, the best condition possible, the sharpest condition possible. And this all also extends to multi-dimensions. It's the same theorem. So um, you're quickly, and you, everyone has seen some stuff with more than one dimension, one dimensional models can be bad, actually. I showed you a couple here that weren't, that you looked innocent and they were actually bad, but you could have n differential equations. Think of planets orbiting around the sun. There's more than one planet and each one has a trajectory. 
So there's n differential equations that model the trajectory of each of those planets circling the sun. And, and I guess I forget now how many planets there are. They keep changing things, right? Um, but we call that an nth order system. You can always tell where everything lives from the initial conditions. There's n initial conditions to get this running. They're in, so this, in it, this space place is Rn. And um, actually, I meant to bring this up, but um, how many of you heard of the Lorentz equations? The butterfly effect? Yeah, so um, these are a fa this is a famous model. It came from a, the Navier-Stokes equations, which model the weather. That's what they're using to predict the weather on a daily basis at any time. They're simulating the Navier-Stokes equations um, for our, uh, our area. And what Edward Lorenz did was around the 50s, they thought that they could actually model, um, get exact predictions if they had just a big enough computer. That was a thing, right? Build, build these gigantic computers and like the old Star Trek movies. And um, what he did is he approximated that nasty Navier-Stokes equation with three ordinary differential equations that look pretty innocent. And um, so I told you I need an example of that notation. Like, what the heck is F1, F2, F3? And so I took this three-dimensional model that's pretty famous. And I just wrote it down. Like, this is my F1, this is my F2, and this is my F3. So I could see it. I am actually named for St. Thomas. My last name is from St. Thomas. We're St. Thomas Catholics. So I need to see to believe. I'm going to have you work with this, running through some stuff in a sec. So actually what I wanted to bring up today was um, I met Edward Lorenz. I was a junior in college and I'd gone to um, a research experience, which actually you guys can't go to because you have so much summer training, but there it's like an AIAD, but for the whole summer. And um, my uh, the guy that was running our course said he was going to meet Edward Lorenz. And I take us too. I want to meet him because by this time, chaos theory and the whole butterfly effect was a big thing. It, what Edward Lorenz showed is when you simulate this model, it's chaotic. Um, that's that term was coined later, but um, he knew that you could never predict the weather because there are so many small perturbations that could make a change in these equations. And what you see when you see this trajectory being simulated is you see it winding around one bubble and then going around and winding around the other bubble. You start slightly different initial condition, it's gonna be winding around in different ways. And so um, he showed that you can't actually predict the weather more than just for a little bit. That's why we have weather reports. Like if you don't look a month ahead and go, what's the weather gonna be like? That's why. And so this was a pretty big deal. And I got him, I printed out a, a Lorenz retractor from Mathematica, the early version of Mathematica, and I had him sign it. So I, it's framed in my office. And he's not alive anymore, so I think it's a, kind of one of my cool things that I have. Um, we're gonna skip this, but there's a Lipschitz version. I just went a little nuts, so I don't wanna cover that. Um, Lipschitz is hard to check, so that's the, like finding a Lipschitz constant is really hard. But if the right-hand side is differentiable, you can check the partial derivatives are bounded. And in this case, you check all the partial derivatives. You, there's no t's. There's just y's and x's. So the partial derivatives are easy, hopefully, because I'm going to have you do it. So that is problem number two, or three. I did post the notes, so don't freak out if there's 78, there's 78 slides. It's because I, I'm really interested in this stuff, but 